lymphatic and immune systems. Here we go. So in the illustration there you see lymphatic vessels and you see lymph nodes. I'll bet you've heard of lymph nodes before. You also see the cisterna chile, which we'll talk about. Um, the lymphatic system is one of the 11 organ systems of the body that you learned back in 201. The immune system is a physiological system. It uses the lymphatic system plus some other organ systems as well. So it's a functional system, not an actual anatomical system. Uh, we always talk about the two of them together. So what does the lymphatic system do? More than you probably think. Um, fluid recovery. So remember in the capillaries, fluid is leaking out. You know, the, remember capillaries are intentionally leaky. And on the arterial side, uh, not only do nutrients leak out, but plasma does as well. Well, that plasma has to be recovered, otherwise what would happen? Yeah, you would have edema. So the lymphatic system actually recovers that plasma. And what does it do with it? It ultimately returns it to the blood. So what started as plasma becomes interstitial fluid, then it's picked up by lymphatic vessels, it becomes lymph, and then it's ultimately returned to the blood. So that's why we think of all of those as being very similar to one another. Blood plasma, interstitial fluid, lymph. Yes, they're different in terms of proportions of solutes and so on, but they all basically flow into one another, flow from one another. They're all part of the same fluid, ultimately. So um, you have a couple of liters a day that have to get recovered. And then immunity. You've used the word immunity before, haven't you? Uh, if you got vaccinated, you're immune to the measles, for example. You're immune to polio. So the immune system basically means that you can't get a disease anymore. So lymph nodes, bone marrow, liver, spleen, thymus, all of those organs play a part in immunity. Lipid absorption. So when you um, eat food, it goes down your esophagus and your stomach, gets broken down by acids and enzymes and gets mashed up, makes it into the small intestine. In the small intestine, it has to get absorbed into your blood. But remember, blood is roughly 50% water and lipids are fats. What do we know about oil and water? You know, they don't mix. So you can't really absorb lipids directly into the blood <clears throat> because they would be floating chunks in the blood. So you absorb sugars and amino acids into your blood, but fats are absorbed by your uh, lymphatic system. So lipids absorbed by lacteals in the intestinal villi form chyle, which is a milky white lymph. So Intestinal villi are little finger-like projections that line the inside of your small intestine. Inside of the villi are blood vessels and little lymphatic vessels called lacteals. So the amino acids and the glucose, the sugars, are absorbed into the blood vessels inside of the intestinal villi, whereas lipids are absorbed into these lacteals. And that causes the lymph, which is normally a clear fluid, to become kind of milky white because fat, I mean, you've seen, you've seen meat in the store. The fat is kind of a white, yellowish white. So the lipids, as they're absorbed into the lacteals, they make the lymph a sort of a milky white there, and we call that chyle. And then transportation, the lymphocytic highway also transports hormones, some nutrients and waste products, pathogens, um, metastatic cancer cells, and so on. So the reason your lymphatic system is called your lymphatic system is because it's where lymphocytes, remember of the five kinds of white blood cells, lymphocytes are one. This is how lymphocytes get around in your body. And the lymph nodes are where lymphocytes hang out. So that how it, that's how it got its name, lymphos lymphatic system, because it's the lymphocytic highway. And... Um, other things get into the lymph. As we said, it recovers all that excess plasma um, that became interstitial fluid down in the cells of your body. Also, waste products made by the cells are going to get taken in. And bad guys, pathogens, can travel in there as well. Likewise, metastatic cancer cells. Those are cancer cells that are spreading. Remember, the big deal with cancer is that if cancer were to stay in one place, it'd be easy to deal with. The problem is that cancer moves around. The, the cancer spreads 
That's called metastatic disease. And the lymph nodes are one of the ways that happens. Um, sometimes women who have breast cancer not only get a mastectomy, but they end up taking out the lymph nodes in the armpit, the axillary uh, lymph nodes, because the cancer has spread from the breast through the lymphatic system into those lymph nodes. So, Lymphocytic Highway, by the way, it's a girl in my class years ago, um, and she wrote a song called Lymphocytic Highway, and it was great. I brought my guitar in, and we all played and sang, Lymphocytic Highway, take me away to that lymph node in my side. I don't, I can remember all the words right now. It was wonderful. It was fantastic. Okay, so what is the lymphatic system composed of? Well, lymph. That's a clear fluid, all right, except in the lacteals where the lipids are absorbed, making it kind of a milky white. Um, and then the composition of lymph varies depending on location. Um, it originates as interstitial fluid, as I said, and so it's similar to plasma, which is what leaked out of the capillaries and became interstitial fluid. It contains fluid, metastatic tumor cells, hormones, pathogens, white blood cells. It is the lymphocytic highway. So that's lymph, that's the fluid itself. Lymphatic vessels um, are how what carry lymph, and then lymphatic tissue is tissue that has lymph, lymphocytes, lymphatic vessels in it, and then we have whole organs that are lymphatic organs. So we're going to talk about each of those in turn and uh, see how they all work together. So notice here, here's a capillary bed. We saw this when we covered the blood. Have the arterial there on the left, the venule on the right, and the capillary bed. That's where the oxygenated blood, you know, it leaks out of the tissues. The oxygen leaks out the glucose, the amino acids leak out. Then on the venule side, that's where we take up waste products like urea and lactic acid and CO2, creatinine, and so on. But notice what we didn't see in the illustrations when we covered the blood was that in fact in that capillary bed there are lymphatic capillaries in there. Those are the green tubes. And what they're doing is they are taking up that extra fluid that leaks out along with some of the waste products and things as well, all right? So that's what's happening. They are, a lymphatic system is a fluid recovery system, okay? Lymphatic capillaries intersperse with blood capillaries in the capillary beds. Excess fluid in some solutes are recovered by lymphatic capillaries. And then what happens, as I said, ultimately, all lymphatic vessels drain back into the blood. They drain into the subclavian veins up underneath your clavicles. So in some sense, I say your lymphatic system is like your, storm, your body's storm drain system. So here in Tucson, we don't have as much of that. But in the Midwest, where they get big, giant, massive summer thunderstorms that last, you know, all day, um, in the streets often, um, in order for the streets not to flood, they have these big openings like this so that the water on the streets can run into these uh, drains. Well, what happens when it goes down here? It goes into big giant tubes under the ground, all right? This is the storm sewer system. Um, this is not the septic sewer system. This is not the toilet. This is just runoff groundwater. And ultimately, where does that all go? Well, it dumps into little creeks and things like that. And they dump into bigger creeks and they dump into oceans, uh, rivers, whatever. And ultimately, they all go back into the ocean. Ultimately, all that rainwater makes its way through streams and rivers and so on back into the ocean. And that's kind of what happens with all, all that fluid in your body. Um, it ultimately makes its way back into the blood. It originally came from the blood. It was a blood plasma. It became ISF, taken up by the lymphatic vessels, becomes lymph. Ultimately, all that lymph drains into your subclavian veins, and once again, it now becomes blood plasma again. See? Cool, huh? Your body's recycling all that fluid. So let's take a look at these lymphatic capillaries because the way they work is really cool. Um, they're dead-end tubes, all right? They don't flow all the way through. And that's so that the, the ultimate direction of flow is one way. All, all lymph is flowing in one direction, all right? Um, they're more permeable than blood capillaries. That means they let stuff in more easily, all right? Permeable. And they have this shingle arrangement. Look at this. See how they have those overlapping shingles where those black arrows are? It's kind of like shingles on a roof. You know how shingles on a roof overlap one another? 
Well, the shingles in the lymphatic capillary, they overlap one another as well. And what's really cool is they have these anchoring filaments. See the black dots and the little thin black lines? So they are connected to the cells of your body. So think about what's going to happen here. When excess plasma leaks out of the blood, um, it becomes interstitial fluid, and temporarily you, you have too much tissue in that, or too much fluid in that tissue. What does all that excess fluid do? It pushes the cells apart from one another, all right? You know, I mean, think about it. You got a bunch of water in that area. It's going to push everything away. So what happens when it starts pushing the cells away? Well, the cells have those anchoring filaments that are connected to the shingles of the lymphatic capillary. So as the, as the cells get pushed away, they pull on that filament, and that allows fluid to be taken up by the lymphatic capillaries. See, isn't that cool? It's kind of like this automatic system that works without anybody telling you what to do. It just works purely on the basis of the amount of fluid that's in there, pushing the cells apart. The cells then pull on the shingles. That opens up the shingles. Therefore, that opens up the lymphatic vessel, and all that excess fluid flows in. Cool, huh? You see that in the bottom right, too. Same kind of thing shown there. Okay, so um, they reabsorb about two to four liters of interstitial fluid every day. All right, if it weren't for your lymphatic system, you would have two to four liters of fluid building up. You would increase your ISF by two to four liters a day. That's a lot. And what's going to happen? Where did the fluid come from, first of all? We've been talking about it all the way along. It came ultimately from your plasma, all right, blood plasma. What happens if it's not reabsorbed into the lymphatic capillaries? You would have edema. You would have edema in all of your tissues. So lymphatic system, very important then for picking up all that extra fluid and ultimately returning it to the blood again. It's present in all tissues in your body except a few. Bone marrow, bones, and teeth don't have any there. Um, cartilage, epidermis, and cornea. Um, remember, cartilage is not vascularized, no blood supply in cartilage, no lymph either. Epidermis, yeah, remember, epidermis is all just dead cells. Cornea, likewise, no blood supply and no lymphatic supply either. They used to say that there were no lymphatic uh, vessels in the brain, but they found out that's wrong. There are, so um, old books might still say that. <clears throat> so... Let's look at what happens here. Let's look at the entire... Remember in, in the blood we looked at the path of blood? Well, let's look at the path of lymph, okay? So first it's picked up, you know, lymphatic capillaries grab all this excess interstitial fluid, drains into the lymphatic capillaries, it's now lymph, all right? We now call it lymph once it's inside the capillaries. Well, those capillaries empty into larger lymphatic vessels, and those empty into big, giant lymphatic vessels called trunks. We saw the same thing with the cardiovascular system, like the celiac trunk, for example, the brachiocephalic trunk. Those were the names for big, giant arteries. Well, big, giant lymphatic vessels are likewise called trunks. And then the big lymphatic trunks drain into ducts. So a duct is the hugest of all lymphatic vessels, and there are only two lymphatic ducts in your body. There's the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. And once again, both of those drain into the subclavian veins. All right, That's where ultimately all lymph goes. It has started as blood plasma, and it comes back to be blood plasma once again. So um, lymphatic absorption and drainage. Many nutrients are absorbed by villi in the small intestine. So there you see pictures of villi, top left and top right. They're, again, they're usually described as finger-like projections on the lining of your small intestine. So you can see, if you look closely, you can see the red and the blue. That would be a little tiny artery, a little tiny vein. And then see the green or yellowish vessel, whatever color that is. Well, it's green in one and yellow in the other. So that's the lacteal, all right? Lacteals are little lymphatic vessels inside of the villi. So again... Sugars and amino acids and other small nutrients are absorbed into the blood, but lipids are absorbed into the lacteals. Again, oil and water don't mix. We don't want fats floating through the blood. They might get stuck, all right? So we have to handle them differently. We let them be absorbed into the lacteal, all right? 
and the resulting milky white lymph is called chyle, C-H-Y-L-E. And then what's going to happen is all the intestinal lymphatic vessels are going to drain into a big, giant reservoir called the cisterna chyle. Cisterna, cistern, you've heard of cisterns before probably. They're like big tanks. You know, like back in Tucson, back before it was a city, back before there was city water stuff, people who lived here, they collected rainwater. That's how you got your water. So you had big tanks called cisterns to collect water. And cisterna chyle, that's because this particular cistern is full of not water, but chyle. So it's a lymphatic sac in the lower thorax, and you can see it in that bottom illustration. You can see it's that green bulge at the bottom of the illustration. That drains all of your intestinal lymph, all right? So that means that it's full of lipids, filled with chyle, which is lymphatic fluid that's rich with lipids. And then lymphatic drainage, again, all lymph ultimately drains into your subclavian veins. That's where it all goes, ultimately. So the thoracic duct is on the left side. That goes into the left subclavian vein. The right lymphatic duct drains into the right subclavian vein. All right. Again, subclavian veins are right underneath your clavicles. So, where would you not expect to find lymphatic vessels? I guess we already know the answer, don't we? I went too fast past it. That would be the out of liver, bone marrow, spleen, intestines, lungs. Yeah, none in the bone marrow. None in the teeth as well. None in cartilage. A few other places like that. So, how does lymph move through your body? Well, it's remarkably similar to the way it worked with veins, remember? Do you remember what made venous blood flow back towards the heart? Think that through and you've already got a head start here on lymphatic flow. So one thing is the rhythmic contractions of lymphatic vessels. So as lymph flows through them, there's some elastic tissue, so they expand and then they snap back. When they snap back, that helps to pump the lymph along, all right? stretches the lymphatic vessel, then it snaps back. That helps to move it along. Automatic contraction of smooth muscle in the lymphatic vessel wall. Then there are valves. Just like there were valves in veins, there are valves in lymphatic vessels. That guarantees that lymph can only flow in one direction, can't ever flow backwards. Then the skeletal muscle pump, which we remember that was the main uh, system for getting uh, venous blood back to your heart, it's also the main way that lymph travels. When you move your skeletal muscles, they squeeze the lymphatic vessels, and that means that because of the valves, lymph is squeezed back closer towards the subclavian veins. The respiratory pump, again, we saw this with the veins. When you breathe, your chest expands and contracts. That also helps to pump both the venous blood and the fluid along. Arterial pulsation. So what happens is, in many cases, um, arteries and veins and lymphatic vessels are all bundled together inside of like the connective tissue sheaths 
inside your body. So when the arteries pulse, then that pulse pushes on the lymphatic vessels, kind of the same way that the skeletal muscle pump would cause that, or the respiratory pump. So the pulsation of arteries squeezes lymphatic vessels, and that likewise helps get lymph back towards your subclavian veins. And then once we get to the subclavian veins, you know, I'm sure you've seen like, you know, on a, like after a monsoon rain, um, you know, the, the, the drainages, the washes suddenly are running with water. And they're running so fast that things on the banks kind of get sucked in. Well, the same thing happens here. So, you know, the lymphatic vessels are coming from above, going down into the subclavian veins. Well, the flow of lymph fluid um, kind of pulls things along with it. So the rapidly flowing blood of the subclavian veins um, will kind of pull the lymph in um, as the blood flows, and that helps the lymph get back into the blood.